Welcome everyone. My name is Nagara Kadumu. I am the manager of public programs at the Fry Art Museum and it's my really great pleasure to welcome you to today's virtual tour in connection with our ongoing exhibition Unsettling Femininity which is on view at the museum through May 30th, 2021. That exhibition was guest curated by Professor Naomi Hume, Professor of Art History at Seattle University, who is going to be our guest speaker for today. If you haven't already checked out the blog post that Naomi produced on the Fry Art Museum blog, please do so to add additional insights and interpretation to your understanding of this exhibition. Thank you so much for being with us today and for agreeing to conduct this virtual tour, Naomi. Please, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Sure, thanks so much, Nagara. It's really um, a pleasure to be here. Um, thanks so much for inviting me to do this program with you. I'm so glad that we're able to continue to give everyone access to the Fry Museum and, um, and its collections through a virtual tour today. Um, so hello everyone, um, as Nagar said, I'm Naomi Hume um, and I curated Unsettling Femininity at the Fry. Um, I'm an art historian and I specialize in modern art from Central and Eastern Europe with a focus on representations of gender. And I teach art history at Seattle University, which is just a few minutes walk from the Fry Museum. So I am used to bringing students to the museum all the time. And I have really missed that in the past few months. So I'm excited to um, do this program and spend at least a little time, um, virtual time <laughs> in the museum. Um, as Nagara mentioned, I wrote a, just a short piece for the Fry at Home blog, uh, reflecting on what it's like to be physically in the museum, um, what experiences of looking and physically being in the same space as works of art, what that um, does to our experience of looking. Um, and we've lost that for right now. And it really does feel different looking at images just on screens. Um, so I'm, I am missing the museum right now, uh, and I thought others might be missing it too. So when I put together this virtual tour, I included images of the galleries, and I've tried to kind of move through the exhibition as I would in a gallery talk so that you can kind of get some sense of um, a small taste of what it's like to be in the museum at the Fry. So I'm really looking forward to when a whole group of people might be able to look at a work of art together in the same space. Um, but for now, let's, let's see what we can do to kind of recreate that experience virtually. Um, what I will do is I will share my screen and show you the first rooms of the exhibition. Here, what you're looking at is our two views of what you would see if you were at the Fry Museum in the first room of the exhibition. And what I'll do is I'll give a short introduction to the exhibition as a whole, and then I will focus in on a couple of images in each gallery. And really what I think um, I'd like to focus on is the theme of looking, of what we do when we look at representations of women and girls and how we've come to understand that activity. The exhibition itself brings together paintings from the Fry Art Museum's founding collection, which are works of art that Charles and Emma Fry themselves bought, mostly between about 1900 and 1925. The idea behind the show is really to prompt viewers to think about what we do when we look at women, to think about the politics of looking. Um, when we look at women as in pictures, but also in real life. The exhibition in its physical manifestation <laughs> extends through four rooms. So each has its own theme. And we begin with the theme of judgment. And then we move through morality, 
performance and conclude with artifice. Throughout, I want to focus on how painters have structured images to encourage particular kinds of looking. How are we prompted to judge, for example, or uh, to think about moral considerations? Um, how do the poses of performers or play acting children reinforce or maybe challenge uh, stereotypes? And if stereotypes seem to exaggerate femininity and bring out its artificiality. What happens when we look at women who are presented as natural or authentic? Uh, and what I think is really interesting about these 19th and early 20th century paintings of women is how the painters are really embodying in their works, the cultural assumptions of their own time. And I think it's really interesting then for us as 21st century viewers to look at this, these images and what happens when we bring our own cultural context with us to that viewing. So if this is the opening room uh, of the exhibition, I wanna call your attention to um, on the, the painting on the farthest uh, right side is um, the painting, a painting by Franz von Stuck. It's called um, The Judgment of Paris. And I'm just gonna go close in on it so you can see it well. Um, and this painting really embodies the theme of judgment um, as well as embodying the way that men and women are pictured differently. The traditions of painting tend to present men as active and women as passive. And it's interesting how Franz von Stuck, even though Paris is doing an a static action, Stuck paints him in an active pose uh, with his leg up on the stone, um, looking, you know, he's in profile. So we have this sense of him, um, you know, not as a static, kind of framed image, but as an active figure. Whereas the women are presented, um, the, the woman in the center is completely frontal to us. So there's no action kind of suggested by her. And it, it helps to know the story behind this image, which is um, an image of three goddesses who are standing in front of the shepherd Paris. He is judging them uh, to decide who will get the golden apple Stuck paints it red, some painters paint it gold. It's the apple that the goddess of discord threw into a party that the gods and goddesses were throwing on Mount Olympus um, and she wasn't invited. So what does she do? She throws the apple in and it says it's to be given to the fairest. Uh, and so of course, all three of these um, goddesses from the left, Aphrodite or Venus and then Hera and Athena, um, all three of them want to be given that title, uh, the fairest of the goddesses. And Zeus wisely uh, decides he's not gonna be the one to judge. So he gives that position to the mortal, this shepherd Paris. So that's the story behind it. What's interesting is this theme has traditionally given painters the you know, a justification for painting beautiful women in the nude because Paris apparently couldn't decide who was the most beautiful unless they took off their clothes. And what we see is that scene, which is the scene that's always shown um, of this uh, uh, from within the whole story, uh, when all of the goddesses stand before him and he's judging them. And there's a way that Stuck has uh, emphasized their uh, positions as, um, as objects to be viewed, either with Athena, the central figure who's holding the staff, who's completely frontal to the, the plane of the picture, to the viewer, um, and Hera in the crown, and then Aphrodite um, uh, close on the farthest left, they're sort of turned um, so that Paris is looking at all of them. But because he puts these, um, they, they hold up their robes behind them. It sort of like frames them within the image as images again, as objects. And so what this painting does really is reinforces those roles, the masculine act activity, the masculine role of action and the feminine 
passivity, which is, um, you know, that, that sort of being looked at, um, being passively uh, assessed. And all of these um, cues that Stuck give, gives us, um, they, they sort of signal that we are supposed to take this position of judgment. Um, and what I find really um, interesting in the museum is that when we move from talking about uh, Franz von Stuck's judgment of Paris and before we move into the next room, what I do is I ask um, viewers to kind of back up against the opposite wall so that what happens is that you get this view, um, which is supposed to sort of look like the three nude women lined up in front of Paris. So we've given viewers in the museum this sort of sense of, okay, now there are three nude women who are lined up in front of you. Do we have to take that role of judge? Is that part of how we kind of respond to images of nude women? That you know, we kind of take for granted in the museum space. And so I wanna take that apart a little bit and look at briefly at these three images and the different ways that they actually kind of present the, the female nude in di ve actually very different ways. Um, the first one on the left here is uh, Gustav Meyer's Stella painting, which uh, gives us actually, um, a pose that is goes back to antiquity, to ancient sculptures of Venus, um, Aphrodite, Venus, uh, of her being born fully formed from the waves of the ocean. And so in this image, we have this figure of the beautiful woman who's, um, you know, got that pose where one leg is bent and she raises his, her arms over her head. Um, originally, that was because Venus is sort of wringing out her hair as she rises from the waves, but it has just become a kind of stereotypical pose that emphasizes women's beauty. And here she looks straight out at us, acknowledges that we're looking at her, raises her arms to I don't know, either put on a necklace or, or some kind of adornment in her hair. Um, and there's a kind of invitation to look. She's looking out in an inviting way. And this is um, one way that painters kind of invite the viewer to enjoy looking at this, uh, at the nude figure. And it's actually quite different from if we look at the very far right side, uh, Lillian Gent's Sun Maiden. If we look at that painting, this is a very different kind of invitation to look. Um, and it emphasizes this sense that the woman in the image doesn't know we're looking at her. So it's a voyeuristic uh, viewpoint. And Genth emphasizes that by putting the foreground a little bit in shadow as if we're you know, hidden in the foreground and then the female figure is in bright sunlight. And she's um, just holding out her arms in this very, um, kind of a casual pose. It's not a, a, a classical, you know, sculptural pose. It's supposed to look kind of like she is just in the midst of contemplating or about to dive into the water. And part of what makes her um, innocent, I would say in this image is that she doesn't know that we are looking at her. Um, and what's, Interesting is that then as we move into the next room, the theme of morality emerges. And it's something that is um, thematized already in these images. Uh, who is responsible for uh, looking? Who is on display on purpose? And where does the sort of line of morality fall? So that gets emphasized in a painting like uh, Winterhalter's Susanna and the Elders, where she looks out at us with, she knows that we're looking unlike the Sun Maiden, but she's not happy about it, unlike Stella. So this painting kind of thematizes the, the idea of capturing a woman unawares. She doesn't want to be seen, but we see her anyway. And there's something very discomforting about that. 
that really comes out once you look closely at the image. So the image is from a biblical story uh, about Susanna, who's a virtuous wife, <laughs> a married woman who is taking a bath um, outdoors in the garden. And the elders who are mentioned in the title are actually visible in the painting. If you look in the very upper left hand corner in the background, you see two little faces kind of emerging from the greenery back there. They are kind of above Susanna, but her reaction, even though she's looking up, her reaction is not to them looking in on her, it's to us. And so that gives us this kind of sense of uh, responsibility, of, um, of a kind of moral reprehensibility. We are spying on her. It kind of brings that voyeurism, it, it sort of makes us feel responsible for that voyeurism. So you might think, okay, so this is an image that's about making the viewer kind of take responsibility for looking, for the implications of looking. But what's interesting is that of course, Winterhalter still gives us the full view of the nude woman, right? He's still assuming that part of the enjoyment of looking at a painting is enjoying this, the, the being able to see the body of this beautiful woman. And so even though the theme of the painting is that she does not want us to see her, he gives us a full view of her. Um, and there's something about that kind of dynamic of seeing and not and thinking you should not be seeing that means that there's a kind of um, sense of of Susanna's value that is um, increased because she's she has this kind of innocence uh, or this unwillingness, this modesty. Um, and so that's part of what is uh, thematized in this in this painting is that push and pull of um, modesty and um, exhibition, I guess. Um, so this room in the exhibition itself, um, once you move into the room, uh, here's what you would see. And there are a number of paintings in here. We're not gonna look at every, every image, but I wanted to focus in on the painting you can see sort of on the left wall there, which is another painting by Franz von Stuck. And this one is titled The Duel. And the reason I wanna look closely at this one is because again, it sort of presents those, um, roles of the active male and the passive female as if they are archetypal, right? There's a kind of um, uh, sort of opposition between the feminine, right? The woman who stands in front of the pillar. So again, there's a kind of framing of her within the image of stilling of her, making her into um, an object even within the image. And that's juxtaposed with this kind of menacing activity of the men who seem to be circling and um, about to engage in the duel of the title. And so what we see is this woman who looks out at us and looks proud of herself, proud of this role of, of this apparent power that she has to uh, instigate this, this fight between two men. But of course her power is really illusory because if we think about it, what happens in a duel is these two men fight and the one who wins the victor will get the girl, right? So ultimately she's the trophy, she's the prize, she's an object, she has no power in this scenario. She must just, you know, go along with whoever uh, is the winner. And so there's a kind of sense here of um, the kind of opposition of masculine and feminine, of active and passive, but also of a kind of responsibility. Um, there's a kind of sense that, um, you know, by putting this image in a room that's themed morality, we're kind of asking about the morality maybe of these two men who are fighting each other, but the way that Stuck foregrounds this woman with her hands on her hips, making her look proud of herself. He's really, you know, calling our attention to her as though she is the instigator of this. Um, and so that question of who is responsible uh, returns when we look at a, a painting like this. Um, there are other paintings in this room that, that 
present that kind of push and pull of morality as well. Um, so if we we're in this room and we kind of turned around uh, to see what was behind us, we would see the, the last three images that are in the room, which uh, bring in these um, a kind of questions of religion and morality, as well as eroticism um, and, uh, and sort of bring all of those questions, um, those themes together. But I'd like to move into the next room, uh, the next theme. So if we moved into the next room, you can kind of see, it's as if we're in the middle of the room, you can see um, on the very left side where we've come from. And so this room is devoted to the theme of performance and it contains um, pairs of images, images that are either of the same person or um, have some kind of thematic connection to each other. And um, if we turn to our left, we'll see the wall um, uh, with some paintings of uh, actresses and other performers. And I'm gonna focus in on um, two paintings uh, the sort of farthest ones in this room, uh, Franz von Lenbach's Eleonora Duse and Friedrich von Kalbach's Geraldine Farrar. Um, these are two images that I think really um, are, are part of what motivated this exhibition and the idea of calling it unsettling femininity, because I think these two images, these two portraits are very unsettling to our eye. Um, and so they raise certain questions about what we expect from images of women. Um, why do these images seem uh, a little strange? Why do these women the way that they look and the kind of unnaturalness of their look. Why does it raise so many questions for us? It's as if we need some kind of narrative explanation for an image that doesn't show a woman and give us beauty as the reason for showing the woman. Um, and what's interesting about these two paintings is that these are some of the biggest celebrities of the moment. Um, Eleonora Duza was one of the most famous actresses of her time. She was a rival of the famous actress, Sarah Bernhardt. And Geraldine Farrar was um, one of the most celebrated opera singers. She's actually an American opera singer, but she was internationally famous um, in the late 19th and early 20th century. So what we're seeing here are two celebrities and the kind of motivation for what we now in the 21st century see as the strangeness of their depictions is that they're being depicted in their roles. Um, Duza was famous for being able to kind of sink into a, a, a role. Um, she is, her kind of approach to acting is what gave rise to um, method acting, this idea of, of sinking into a character and inhabiting that character. She was famous for insisting that she as a person was not important. Um, away from the stage, I don't exist is one of the, the famous um, quotations from Duza. And she was famous for being able to kind of imbue silence with meaning. And I think that's kind of what we have here, this melodramatic almost, um, you know, clutching of the breast and turning aside and looking off intensely into the, you know, distance sort of behind or beside her. And um, so what we see here is Lenbach giving us the essence of her acting. Um, but if we, from the 21st century, we don't know who this is at first, we want to know why would somebody paint a portrait of somebody, of a woman in this way. And similar with Geraldine Farrar, she's an opera singer and Kalbach paints her with that white stage makeup. Um, so he's sort of showing us her in her role as performer. Um, and in the early 20th century in Germany, she was famous for playing two roles in particular um, in two different operas, uh, Marguerite from the opera Faust and um, Manon from Manon of the Spring, both of whom are these figures of 
innocent young women who are corrupted by men and lose their reputations as a result. And they both end up suffering um, uh, or dying at the end. And so what we see here is that kind of um, intensity um, I think they're, they even sort of seem to sink into madness at the end of um, both operas. And so what we have here with this long hair that's sort of twisting around her neck in the 19th century, long hair that is um, long and flowing was a kind of sign of wildness or um, a kind of uncontrolled sensuality. It was women, um, full-grown women did not wear their hair loose. And so respectable women are always depicted with their hair carefully contained. So the hair that is sort of almost strangling her in this image, it's, it's both a sign of kind of her lack of control or her um, madness maybe, but it's also this kind of dramatic aspect of, um, of her role. So I think both of these images kind of take on more meaning when we know about the celebrities they depict and the kinds of roles that they played and how these images would have been seen in the 19th century and early 20th century would have been seen by the Fries themselves as images that embody these celebrity figures. But that without that information, these images look so strange to us. It just kind of highlights how narrow the confines are. Um, of uh, for representing women in ways that um, don't strike us as unusual or strange. So if we look at other images in this gallery, um, if we move, so if we're in the gallery, imagine you're turning to your right and you would see uh, these paintings uh, of children. And I wanna focus in on one pair of these, uh, those tiny paintings um, on the uh, sort of in the center of this image. Um, and if we get in close, we see these two paintings that show uh, children. And I kind of wanna call attention to how similar, there's a similarity in these images to the very first painting I talked about, the Franz von Stuck, the judgment painting, right? Where the little boy here is shown in profile and the profile sort of activates him. And the little girl, even though she seemingly is presenting herself to him, is actually facing the viewer. So that dynamic of act Activity and passivity is playing out even when Zumbush is painting these little children. There's something a little uncomfortable about that to, to viewers now. I think at the time in the late 19th and early 20th century, when Zumbush was painting these, they were considered sort of amusing um, images, kind of anecdotal images. And um, But what I think they bring out to us now is this kind of play acting of children, of learning to inhabit these socially expected roles. Um, the idea that these roles are actually learned and that children practice them um, and that there's something that um, we find funny about children playing these roles before they become adults um, and learning the way that adults behave towards each other. And what that reminds us of is that these are not just natural behaviors. These are learned behaviors. They're behaviors that, um, that we take on. Um, and that's something just to, to remember that these are not just kind of natural ideas about uh, masculinity or femininity or um, the various uh, kind of the spectrum of gender um, along that line. Now, if we turn back to the room that we're in, so if we have kind of our backs to those two paintings we just looked at, and you can um, see all of these paintings uh, that are paired here, they show us images of professional performers. And I wanna just focus briefly on one more pair uh, before we move into the final room um, uh, the th for the theme of artifice. And so I'm gonna look at the images that are, the paintings that are on the far left right now. Um, there are two paintings of the dancer Saharet. And what I think it, there's, there's kind of two different levels 
on which these two paintings are interesting. One is, um, these are painted by two different painters and they look very different and to, to the point that Franz von Lenbach gives her blue eyes and Franz von Stuck gives her brown eyes. So what's going on here? Why do we see these very different representations of this figure? Saharet was a famous dancer. She was another celebrity figure of her time famous for a kind of acrobatic dancing that included flips and cartwheels and, you know, somersaults into splits and high kicking. Um, and she kind of took the European stage uh, by storm in the late 19th century. And Franz von Lenbach thought she was, well, he's, he's quoted as having thought she was the, the most beautiful woman in the world. He was one of the most sought after portrait artists in Europe at the time but he had to pay her in order to be able to paint her portrait. Um, and so there's something kind of interesting about what he does. He paints her, he turns her into a kind of idealized beauty um, that involves kind of softening her, you know, everything about her and giving her this demure expression. And she looks off into the distance with those pale blue eyes. And even though we can recognize her as the same figure because of the hairstyle and, and a certain similarity uh, between the depictions, it's really interesting that what Franz von Stuck does is he emphasizes her artificiality. He emphasizes her role as performer. So again, like uh, in Kalbach's painting of Geraldine Farrar, he shows us the white stage makeup and the dark coal that outlines her eyes. Um, and she looks straight out at us. Um, and not only that, but she shows her teeth, which is something really unusual in portraits of the, this time. Um, the smile showing teeth is something that really comes into the depiction of women only in the mid 20th century. It had a brief heyday in the 18th century. And then again, it comes back with photography in the middle of the 20th century. Before that, showing one's teeth was really um, considered a kind of sign of impropriety. I think what happens here is that Stuck is trying to emphasize, I mean, her dancing is this brash kind of activity of, you know, flips and splits and high kicks. And I think what he's doing here by showing us um, her smile is that he's emphasizing that unconventionality of her. And it also emphasizes a kind of that artificiality um, of her performance, of her being a performer. Um, whereas uh, Lenbach in order to emphasize what he thinks of as the most beautiful woman in the world, in order to emphasize her beauty, uh, not only does he soften every line and he gives her blue eyes. And it's interesting, especially because um, scholars have recently investigated who is this figure of Saharat? And it turns out she's originally from Australia. She was born uh, Clarissa Maloney um, to an Irish father and a mother who had Chinese heritage. And so what's interesting is that Saharet covered that up, hid that part of her background, but took on a different kind of exoticizing um, uh, identity by calling herself Saharet. She took on um, an identity that was considered, um, uh, that was, fashionable for Europeans in the end of the 19th and early 20th century um, and hid her actual heritage, which is a really interesting um, aspect of these two paintings as well, to just think about how uh, Saharet as a performer is also kind of creating an artificial identity for herself. And that kind of leads us into, if we look at um, this room once more, you can see next to those paintings of Saharet on the left is the entrance to the final room, which is devoted to this theme of artifice. Um, and so in this room, there are a number of paintings brought together, um, a series of them, both the four paintings that are on the long wall and then the paintings opposite them on this long wall. They are all images of women in um, European folk costume. 
So one of the things that I wanted to kind of think about after having gone through looking at um, this artifice is to think about what does it, what did the 19th century represent as natural? And they really turned to um, a kind of traditional representation of women in um, folk costume, uh, in kind of local regional costume, as if that was a kind of timeless representation of the way women look. Um, and yet at this time, uh, at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, it was actually quite unusual for women to be wearing that traditional folk costume. Um, it was really only on festivals, often for tourists, that they wore that costume. And so I wanted to just think about how these painters, um, even as they are trying to produce this image of um, kind of timeless natural beauty, they are creating an illusion, um, the, the artifice of this uh, in a time when modernization had really changed the way the countryside looked as much as it had changed um, urban spaces. Um, and do I have time to do one more or should we just stop there? I think we, in the in light of time, we should probably go to Q&A if that's okay. okay with you. But I think we can sort of work in, and please feel free to do so, your, the comments that you were going to make it perhaps in response to the, the, the two questions that I have. And so, okay. First of all, thank you for just a really, really amazing uh, tour. This is great. You know, of course, we would all love to be in the museum, but this is certainly the next best thing. And so the, the, the first question that I have is sort of an overarching one. All of the words that you've been using in terms of describing each of each of the, the the sections in the exhibition, but also the individual paintings have been words that connect to viewing, connect to sight. And so perspective, lens, um, profile, all of those things. And so given now that we have, 2020 is coming to an end, very few people have seen the exhibition with the exception of that small window of time when we, when we reopened in the early fall and the very beginning of 2020, very few people have been able to see this exhibition when compared to 2019. And right. so how does that in your estimation um, further change or impact our ability to really look at art, but specifically the art of this period that portrayed um, women's gender identity in these very specific ways that, you know, on first impression are really for the pleasure from my perspective of men. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a hard question, Nagar. It's really interesting though. Um, so how does, do you mean to say kind of how does the sort of inaccessibility of the exhibition itself during 20, much of 2020, how does that kind of heighten some of these themes? Precisely. Um, Precisely. Yeah, that's interesting. I think I mean, if we think about how some of the paintings in the exhibition play on themes of um, the kind of accessibility or availability of the woman in the image to the viewer, you might say that these images in some ways are offering, I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of struggling with this. These images kind of offer up um, an image, uh, a, a sort of sense of viewing as an, an easy activity, right? As something that you're invited in to do. That's something that you shouldn't even really think about while you're doing it. And so many of these paintings 
um, really try to make us forget that we're looking at images. They try to sort of play down the, the, the sense of them being paintings. You know, often they have shiny surfaces and, you know, you can't really see the brush strokes. Um, and they kind of convey the ease, um, the power of looking. They invite you to experience a kind of power. So maybe uh, the inaccessibility of museums right now is um, kind of helping us see how strange that is. Um, one of the things that I think is, is really important about, or important about looking back at paintings from a previous time mm -hmm. um, is that we can kind of make the ways that we habitually look, mm -hmm. we can make that strange for ourselves in order to kind of learn how to see the, the kind of con constructs through which we have come, that we've come to accept and, and kind of not question. So maybe the idea of, um, you know, feeling like being in a museum and looking at images um, is an, a, a sort of feels unusual in mm -hmm. our moment right now, mm -hmm. actually adds to the, our ability to, to kind of see the constructedness, not only of the images, but of the kind of what we do in a museum. And maybe that gives us a chance to question it um, and to question how we respond and whether um, we can, we can sort of change how we understand these images. I don't know, does that kind of get at what no, you were? I mean, that's, that's, yeah. a, that's a very good beginning. I mean, and it's, it's helping me to put together some of my thoughts around the, the, the themes that you have um, selected to focus on. So a, another question that I have is, you know, the, the title of the exhibition is Unsettling Femininity, which I think is such an apt title. And it was actually, you know, through the first tour that you did at the end of last year. Right. Um, I can't believe it's been a year <laughs> since that happened, but so at the I end- I think it's almost a year. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I think okay. it's no, almost no. exactly a year yeah. since I yeah. my last in yeah. museum yeah. tour. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so it was in that tour where I really took notice of Susanna and the Elders, um, as well as the two paintings of the young children. Right. And I, I, I appreciate it, what it is that you shared then, as well as what it is that you have shared um, just now. And I was curious to know, now that the exhibition has been up for over a year and will be up through halfway through 2021, what about this exhibition, when you go back and look at certain paintings or certain groups of paintings, what about this exhibition still unsettles you? What would be <laughs> additional threads that perhaps you didn't have the opportunity to really explore in this exhibition, but if you were to take that, this notion of unsettling further, what would be some of those ideas um, that you would want to explore? Oh, that's so interesting. Um, well, I have to say that the, I'm, I'm really interested in the, um, what I started to talk about with that painting of Saharet with her teeth. That's something that is that I have recently been um, looking into this. Why is it that uh, we don't see <laughs> um, smiles in paintings? I mean, I get it in early photographs, it, it looked strange and frozen, but, um, but to discover that uh, the smile is actually a, a historical phenomenon in some way, right? Um, that it is uh, something that is really cultural, um, and really only becomes something that's ubiquitous and acceptable um, in the mid 20th century is something that new that I've sort of started thinking about. I don't know if that takes, if that's sort of getting back into um, issues from the exhibition, although um, I have been thinking about that painting by Saharet and why it's so unsettling and wondering if 
that's part of it, that we're not used to seeing that. And two other paintings in the show that also uh, show us women um, with their teeth visible are Franz von Lenbach's Voluptas and Ecstasy, which I didn't talk so much about uh, in, uh, let's see, in, but they're, they're the two paintings um, that are kind of on the left in this in this image, but both of them show their teeth, and they're very and they're strange too. It's it's sort of weird that that you can see that. I don't know if that really takes it really answers your question. Um, a, a different answer could be just um, that I continue to be fascinated by this idea of of um, how these these paintings really thematize the issue of, of play acting or inhabiting mm -hmm. roles um, and how the idea of femininity as performative is mm -hmm. something that continues to provoke all kinds of interesting mm -hmm. thoughts and conversations. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say that you know, when I was able to give tours in the museum um, several times at the end of the tour, and this was mostly young women who were attending the tour, um, would come up to me afterwards to talk about some of the issues raised by, by the exhibition. Mm -hmm. And they would ask me, well, what do we do? Um, and I don't have an answer for that question either, but I think that's definitely uh, the direction that I would hope this exhibition mm. prompts others to go in. <laughs> um, oh, so I don't know if that answers your question. Oh no, definitely. I have some thoughts. No, definitely. It's it's definitely moving in the in in that direction. I'm always curious to know what curators think about their exhibition after it has right. been up for so long, or even sometimes after it's closed. One. Yeah. Last question to round us out, um, sort of uh, the cornerstone of the Fry's, one of the cornerstones rather of the Fry's per, uh, permanent collection. Um, and one, you know, painting that is, is, is quite popular is Sin. Right. And that painting has always struck me as very different from a lot of paintings of women that were, ha were happening during that time, but definitely from a lot of the paintings that are in this particular um, exhibition. And the main reason why is that though, yes, she is nude and that yes, you still have some of those same suggestions around, she is there to be consumed. She is looking directly at the viewer which is very different than many, again, many paintings of that time, but also many paintings in that exhibition. And that for me really gives a different sense. It almost gives a sense of intentional knowing, um, depending on how, you know, how, how far you, you take your interpretation, intentional knowing that she is there to be consumed and positioning and po posturing in a way that is um, what she wants to do rather than what she's being coached to do. Mm. Um, and so I was just curious on your, on your thoughts um, of sin um, sort of contextualized by what you've shared today. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think that this is part of why I wanted to put um, the painting, this painting, Sin, in this room uh, where the theme is morality, uh, in part because there's a kind of sense of, um, like the painting of Stella, there's a kind of sense that the woman depicted in Sin is responsible for her own um, exhibition, uh, exhibition of herself, or, you know, the sort of expo her, her exposure. She's unashamed, she presents herself, um, you know, in a way that does not look like, um, does not feel voyeuristic, right? We, we are not uh, catching a glimpse that is unsanctioned. 
um, she is brazenly, you know, exposing herself to view. But what's important to remember is that Stuck frames that image so ornately in a reminder that what is happening here is sin, right? So there's a sort of sense of impropriety um, that is cast on the painting or on the viewer, uh, on the figure of sin, you know, and of course she has a snake draped around her. So you think, oh, well, it's the theme of Adam and Eve and sin, but of course there's no Adam presented in the painting. So the, the sort of, I don't know, the way, the consequence of that is that the viewer becomes the figure of Adam, right? The viewer becomes the person with the moral dilemma. Um, and I mean, there are, there are lots of other things you could say about it because he, Stuck gives the painting um, a frame that looks like a classical temple. So he's taking it out of Christianity, right? To, to ancient Roman or Greek religion. Um, what, you know, while calling attention to this biblical story. So there's lots of ways that you can sort of change the interpretation there. But I think what's important is that, yes, you have these images of women who are fully aware of themselves being on view, but there are ways in which the painter has presented that behavior as, or presented the behavior of various different women as laudable or not, as good or bad. Um, so that even as we are getting this example of a woman who is assertive and unashamed, um, we're being told that that's, um, that that's a sinful thing, right? So, I mean, especially if you contrast it with the Christian martyr, which is another kind of eroticized religious painting um, uh, that I wanted right next to it. She is posed as, you know, the absolute opposite of sin, right? She's, she looks like she's sleeping. She's supposed to be dead. But when that painting was first shown, she was considered the most beautiful figure. People, I mean, people went crazy for that painting. It was so popular because she was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. There's almost a sense of that a woman has to be that passive <laughs> in order to be considered beautiful. Whereas the activity and assertiveness of this figure of sin mm -hmm. um, doesn't confer beauty on that figure, on the, on the figure in the painting. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I mean when I say, you know, painters are really, they're not just giving us um, a transparent window mm -hmm. onto what they saw, they're giving us an embodiment of their own cultural assumptions. And those cultural assumptions have everything to do with looking and our, what, we, what we think when we see. Exactly. Um, that was kind of a long <laughs> answer to that. that but great. yeah, that painting is fascinating for that reason. Yeah, that was great. That was great. Naomi, thank you so much. This has been another really amazing view into unsettling femininity. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today about the exhibition. The exhibition is up through May 30th, 2021. Please don't forget to check out the accompanying blog post on the Fry From Home blog. And thank you so much for joining and we look forward to being in conversation with you again soon. Thanks again.